Mobile technology is ubiquitous. Across Europe, the use of tablets and smartphones is commonplace and increasing. On the left, we see the number of tablet owners across Europe is on the rise. On the right, we see the huge numbers of people accessing social media from mobile devices right across Europe. This rapid rise of mobile technology has not escaped the field of medicine. Mobile technology is also commonplace amongst medical practitioners and at Manchester Medical School, students are using their iPads all the time, including as part of their clinical learning. Clinical learning is here defined as in preparation for teaching sessions, in between classes, on the ward for quick reference and in preparation to see patients. Mobile technology is indeed ubiquitous. What we don't know, however, is what impact having access to the iPad or being constantly plugged into information is having on learning. And this poses a very interesting question. That is, is Google making us stupid? Now a team of researchers sought to answer that very question. In their paper, Google Effects on Memory, Cognitive Consequences of Having Information at Our Fingertips. Here's a copy of their report. And I'd just like to highlight this sentence. The internet has become a primary form of external or transactive memory, where information is stored collectively outside ourselves. We'll come back to this concept later in the presentation. The results of this study were that people quickly think of computers when they need to acquire knowledge. That people are more likely to forget information which they assume they can come back to easily in the future, for example, on their smartphone. And participants were more able to remember where information was rather than the piece of information itself. And they close with this interesting paragraph. We are learning what the computer knows and when we should attend to where we have stored information in our computer-based memories. We are becoming symbiotic with our computer tools and it continues. Now before we could investigate the effect of this on medical students, we first had to establish whether this was occurring, whether students were using their iPads in this way as a transactive memory store. So what is transactive memory? Well, it was described in the 1980s by Wegner, and he defines it as a system where two or more individual memory systems communicate to develop a combined memory system. An example which he uses is this. There's a couple and they experience a blackout in their home. Now one partner knows where the candles are, but can't get to them in the dark. The other, is able to navigate the house in the dark, but doesn't know where the candles are stored. Individually, they're not able to reach their determined goal, but together, combining their memory systems, they're able to find the candles. This is an example of a transactive memory system. What we wanted to know was whether students were using iPads as a transactive memory store in the same way. In our work, we wanted to capture medical students' naturalistic use of their iPads in the clinical environment. However, due to the possibility of coming across patient-sensitive data, we could not capture what people did in real clinical situations. Instead, we opted to create clinical scenarios that were likely to be encountered in the clinical environment. An example of these will be shown later in the presentation. So what were the aims of the study? Well, firstly, to determine how medical students use the iPad to approach clinical scenarios. Secondly, to determine whether medical students' use of the iPad showed evidence of transactive memory use. How did we do the study? Well, students were recruited to the study via an announcement on the school's virtual learning environment and other means. The potential pool of participants was approximately 1,400 students. 
Students who agreed to participate, for privacy reasons, were asked to clear their browsing history and cookies, so that personal or private information would not be captured in the study. They were then asked to complete a consent form, and the iPad was set up for screen capturing. Now this was done using two pieces of software. The first, called Reflector, this enabled what was being done on the iPad to be mirrored onto another device, in this case, a MacBook Pro. Another piece of software, called ScreenFlow, then enabled us to record what was being mirrored onto the MacBook Pro. In this way, we were able to capture and record what participants were doing on the iPad. Participants were given two cases appropriate to their previous or current year's learning and were asked to complete two tasks. The first task and the second was done with the participants verbalising their thought processes as they did the task. After completing both tasks, a questionnaire was given to the participants to complete. Here are some examples of the cases that they were given. This first case centers on transient ischemic attacks. Get a brief explanation of the problem and then how the problem is managed. The second is for students in their nutrition, metabolism and excretion placement and centers around peptic ulcer disease. Again, they're given a brief description of the patient and then how the patient is managed. So how did we analyse the data? Well, screen captured iPad activity was coded into discrete actions, defined as a move from one action to another. For example, opening a new app, and then accessing a new web page, and then entering a new term in a search engine. And these actions were coded using an iterative coding scheme to describe the actions. The actions were then timestamped and therefore the time spent in each type of action was able to be calculated. Here is the spreadsheet that was produced. I'll draw your attention to participant 6. Their first action is performed at 1 minute 19 where they open pages, a word editing app and create a new document and titles it. This takes 2 minutes 58 seconds. Their second action is they open the patient UK app and enter search term urinary tract infection. This takes 28 seconds. The rest of the recording is coded in a like fashion. We then needed to determine what transactive actions look like and they came down to three actions and these were guided by features found in Wegner's description of transactive memory. The first was accessing previously stored or accessed information Second, making notes to refer to at a later date. And the third, downloading resources onto the iPad. Here are some examples of the screen captures. The first is what we might call an expert user. This participant has just closed down the internet browser where they had searched for a term they were not familiar with. They then open the BNF app for children. They type in the search term that they know they will, that they know will bring up the result intended. This participant will then go on to spend the next 15 minutes on this app, knowing that this app contains all the information they need for the case. The next participant is what we might call a non-expert user. So again, the participant starts at the same place, on Wikipedia, defining a term that they're not familiar with. They then go back to the search results, and they scroll through the results, not looking for any particular result, but if there might be any that might be useful. They then change the search, And again, we see that they're not looking for a particular resource, but looking if they might find anything helpful. They select the second, and after it, shortly after it loads, they will return to the search page and select the first result, which was indeed the more appropriate one, as it was the NHS guidelines. So what did we find in our study? 
and in total we had 43 participants, 51% of which were male. It's important to note that in the results presented here, only 40 of the participants are presented, and three of the recordings has a recording issue at the beginning of them. It's also important to mention here that 21% achieved honours in their last result, and 23% of the participants expected to graduate with honours. This represents a slightly higher than normal a group of honours students. The normal rate is 15%. So about the study itself. Well, on average, participants took 27 minutes to complete the task. The fastest was done in 6 minutes, and the longest was done over the allocated time with 33 minutes. From the left chart, you can see that a good proportion of the time 41% was spent using web browsers. This equates to 7 hours in total, followed by word processing apps, with a total number of hours being 4.5. We can see then on the right the percentage of time spent using offline medical apps. The most popular app was BNJ Best Practice, with 51% of the time spent on this. This equates to 1 hour 45 minutes. But what of transactive actions? The total number of actions were 3,090. These actions include actions that form part of a pathway. For example, if a patient was looking for the PDF form of, of some guidelines, the total number of actions would include all the steps from entering the search entry into Google right up until accessing the PDF of the document. It's significant to note that 10% of the participants' activity could be described as transactive. This is storing actions and also accessing previous information. In capturing real-time iPad activity, this study is the first of its kind in exploring the use of mobile technology in the clinical environment. Where others have used self-reported data, we were able to use direct observation. And in doing this, we found that students use the iPad in various different ways to approach clinical learning scenarios. Varying combinations of web browsers, medical apps and word processing apps are used to get to a point of satisfactory knowledge. In our study, we also found that there was evidence that the iPads are being used amongst medical students as a transactive memory store. It's surprising to note how few students appear to be accessing previously accessed information, as the cases were taken from modules recently covered by the participants. It was expected to find that more students would access previously used notes. Now it may be that the way the cases were presented meant that the students thought they were being asked to approach the scenario as if it was a new one. It's important to note that the study was done in a simulated environment and students were aware that they were being recorded. Having said that, it seems that the students weren't particularly hindered by this knowledge. They weren't afraid to use resources such as Wikipedia and YouTube suggesting that this may not have affected their normal use of the iPad to approach clinical scenarios. It is important to mention, however, that Wi-Fi availability was consistent, whereas this is not always the case in hospital. So it may be that in hospital, when they don't have access to Wi-Fi, they may be forced to rely on more offline resources. Increasingly, mobile technology will become a normal part of medical education. It's it is important that follow-up experiments are done with medical students to determine the impact this is having on learning. One option may be to repeat the Sparrow study with medical students using medical knowledge with a before and after knowledge assessment. In summary, mobile technology is ubiquitous right across Europe, including amongst medical professionals. Constant access to the internet may mean we're beginning to use it as a transactive memory store. Medical students at Manchester University are using their iPads as a transactive memory store. And further studies are required to assess the longer term impact of the use of the iPad on learning.
Thank you very much for listening.